Hi everyone, welcome to Bold Conjectures with Paris Chopra. Today I'm with Jamie Harris, uh, who is co-founder of and researcher at the non-profit Animal Advocacy Careers, a non-profit uh, that seeks to identify and remove bottlenecks in the animal advocacy movement with a special focus on farmed animal advocacy. Jamie is also a researcher at the Sentient Institute, a non-profit organization dedicated to researching how we can expand humanity's moral circle to include other non-human sentient beings like animals and in future AI systems. Jamie's career is inspired by the effective altruism ideology, which aims to figure out how we can do the most good in the world. So idea being, uh, you know, the, the idea is to be rational about figuring out uh, which of our actions have the biggest bang for the buck when it comes to improving the world. So as you can imagine, uh, from Jamie's focus, he believes that alleviating suffering for farmed animals is a high priority goal. So today, uh, I want to talk to him about uh, why he believes in that versus, say, helping poor or unhealthy humans, uh, where today's animal advocacy movement uh, is focused and uh, what we can learn from previous social movements such as anti-slavery for uh, achieving a world where animals are removed from the food supply chain. And it's a cause that I very much believe in. So I'm very, very excited to have Jamie uh, on this podcast today. Uh, welcome, Jamie. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. Yeah, excited to be here. Great. So Jamie, I wanted to start with understanding your career. Um, so can you trace your career? How did you get interested in the effective altruism movement? Uh, I know you have run uh, London's chapters for the uh, effective altruism. And then ultimately, what led you to focus on animal advocacy? Yeah, um, good question. So I guess I actually came at kind of animal advocacy before I became involved in this effective altruism community, this community of people focusing on doing good as essentially cost effectively as possible. Um, so the career question, well, I think I've long felt that I wanted to do good in my career and I've long had that kind of drive. And so I've had that from a fairly young age. And I think I did what most people do at least I think a lot of people do when they're thinking about how to do good in the world. And that is, I turned to career paths, which were essentially um, conventional, you know, lots of people did them. Uh, and you, you kind of heard of the idea. And I also turned to opportunities that seemed direct, you know, the path to impact, you could do something and see the results, that sort of thing. So from when I was in school, my plan was to become a teacher. Uh, because that kind of fits both those criteria. I knew plenty of people who were teachers. I'd been taught by teachers all my life and that sort of thing. Uh, and obviously, when you're teaching a bunch of students, you're in front of them and you can see the results. You know, you see them learning and you see the the brains, uh, the, the kind of cogs whirring in their heads and all that sort of thing. So that's what I turned to. And I kind of assumed that that was what I was heading towards. So when I was at university, I didn't take, take the opportunity to do kind of internships and things like that, which a lot of students do, because I was quite focused on being a teacher. I kind of just thought, right, that's it. I've, yeah. I've worked it out. Um, so I was building towards that. And I did do that. I did that for essentially three years. Um, my mind changed about this when I came across some ideas which I hadn't really considered before. And I think this is a this is a particularly complicated factor. So it's not necessarily like should be the deciding factor for everybody. But for me, the idea that changed my mind quite a lot was this idea of replaceability that I'd never come across that I read about on the website of an organization called 80,000 Hours, whose whole purpose is dedicated to essentially helping people who want to do good achieve that through their career, basically. Um, and so this idea of replaceability is that you have to not just consider the direct impact you're having, but what would be happening if you weren't having that impact? would there be someone else or something else having an equivalent or similar impact? And so the idea with teaching is that it's, if I wasn't teaching those students, there would likely be somebody else teaching them something similar and probably to similarly well. Um, often I suspected that they would have been teaching it better than I was because I was quite new and kind of enthusiastic, but didn't have much else going for me as a teacher compared to other possible teachers you might have had. Um, so yeah, this idea of replaceability just made me less optimistic about it because if you count you, essentially, you can't count everything that you appear to be achieving as as if you've completely achieved that because somebody else would have done so anyway. Um, so what this kind of pushes towards is considering some some slightly more unconventional career paths that you might not have thought about. And like I said, I long wanted to do good. I'd, I'd kind of long had motivation to help animals. I kind of long seen uh, that 
they, their interests were not protected by everybody and that there were things in that there were things which to me seemed uh, appalling that were happening to animals on a regular basis so I kind of long had that as a as a motivation I just hadn't really connected joined the dots that I might be able to do good to help animals through my career essentially um and you know I was I'd kind of I'd even founded like an activism group when I was at university and I was part of that but it didn't I still didn't really <laughs> think about the idea that I could actually work full-time in the space so I'm not sure where that mindset changed I suppose I think it was probably to do as you say I, I've been involved in kind of local community building in London around this idea and I think it was partly through that you know it's the way I got involved with that was actually I signed a pledge to donate 10 percent of my income every year and just through signing that pledge uh, I was connected to somebody who was doing that kind of community building in London who reached out to me and I became involved in that way and just by organizing that community and thinking about the topics more carefully and kind of regularly I suppose and meeting with like-minded people and that sort of thing uh, helped me to join the dots and realize oh I can I can potentially work in this space and I have things to contribute you know like I was quite quickly becoming quite knowledgeable about the subject matter and the kind of strategic considerations um just by reading about these things in my spare time essentially and doing some kind of research in inverted commas of just kind of like summarizing what other people have done and that sort of thing just because it's a new area and there's not a lot of people doing it that replaceability factor is less important um because there are it's not as it's more kind of yeah, there are fewer really talented people pushing to to work in the space and that sort of thing in general. Right. So I could probably keep rambling, but <laughs> I'll let you <laughs> no, jump I mean, in. What, what, I, what I find uh, really interesting uh, in your career arc is when you mentioned 80,000 hours, mm -hmm. uh, I mean, reading that one idea had a perspective change. I mean, sometimes when we do intellectual work in terms of writing essays, I mean, I know your work uh, is not intellectual, in terms of its products, which is research reports, advice, and so on and so forth. I think sometimes it feels, uh, I mean, at least to me, when I write essays on my blog, it feels like uh, maybe whether it's having impact or not, but mm -hmm. hearing that uh, one idea, which is well-framed can make people question whether they are on the right path or not. I think it's gratifying to see that um, ideas having such a sort of a significant impact in people's careers, like it did for yours. Yeah, it definitely can. And obviously that's very anecdotal. Um, I worry sometimes that I try and learn too much from my own personal experience and it's too anecdotal and I may be an unusual person in a number of ways. Um, I, th I do agree that you definitely, it does happen that just putting the ideas out there sometimes can make a big difference. Uh, but I do also think that a lot of the time, the way that we encourage change is often through the kind of behavioral support mechanisms as well. This is something that's come up in some of the research I've done for Sense Institute on uh, I just kind of reviewed research that there is on health behavior. So that's about getting people to eat more healthily, smoke less, exercise more, those sorts of things. And the idea was reviewing that research with a view to seeing if any of it applies to the context of the farm animal movement. And particularly people are often in the farm animal movement, often making asks to do with diet consumption. And, you know, can you, uh, eat higher welfare meat instead of low welfare meat or cut meat products out of your diet completely, that sort of thing. Um, okay. And just as a, it's a, it's a very broad generalization and this I'm sure many people object to the characterization I'm about to give, but of the interventions I looked at, the ones that were purely kind of educational, informational, they did, you know, in all these meta-analyses, hundreds of scientific studies kind of analyzed on these topics. Overall, they do tend to have an effect. It's a small effect, but there's a significant effect that kind that comes out in these meta analyses. But the effects tended to be somewhat larger in interventions that had at least some kind of behavioral component as well. And so that could be motivational interviewing, which is where you kind of speak to people and kind of encourage them to take action on their plans. A, a quite a concrete example is there's this thing called action planning, which okay. is one of several techniques that people use where it's along the lines of if I encounter this particular barrier, I will do this thing. So in, okay. in, in healthy diet, the, the, um, the example is often things like, oh, every time I want a bar of chocolate, I will have an apple instead or something okay. like that. So right. yeah, I do, I, ideas can change people's minds, <laughs> but I think often, right. I think often people will, are overconfident in that and they think as long as i just spread awareness the job will be done <laughs> which which often sadly does not happen and this is a kind right. of recurring theme in Stenzies institute's research is that just kind of awareness spreading and education often has some kind of effect but it's smaller than you might expect or hope and actually social change and behavioral change is often driven through other mechanisms i think this is a good reminder uh, I, I guess i 
I would know once you've mentioned it, but, uh, um, but I, I, I think it's, it's obvious that information would not work for everyone to change their behavior. Not everyone who comes across like a new research uh, or a meta-analysis just goes about and changes their life. Uh, I mean, it's sort of like, you know, everyone knows going to the gym is healthy, but it requires a lot of behavioral change uh, tactics to ultimately get that done. Um, I, I, I wanted to pick, uh, I mean, I wanted to sort of deep dive into this concept of replaceability. And uh, that's because I, when I was reading your research reports and articles, I felt it's, uh, it's sort of like a recurring theme, wherein in different contexts, uh, uh, you, you've sort of concluded it's very hard to be entirely uh, irreplaceable. I mean, especially I remember, recall reading about the mo- environmentalism movement where you were talking about some books uh, have probably accelerated uh, the movement, but uh, when the ideas are in the air, uh, certain things you know just tend to happen. So do you worry about this a lot, wherein can sort of at the extreme, what you're doing can be irreplaceable or whether that just accelerates the inevitable? Don't worry about a lot. It definitely comes up in a number of ways. And that's an interesting example because I tend to think of replaceability as a kind of career strategy consideration. But you're right in that that example with the with the impact of books. And I, I think you might be referring to just had a bit of a look at trying to work out what sort of impact Rachel Carson, who was a kind of uh, influential thinker on the early sort of US environmentalism movement, yeah. trying to work out what impact did that book have. And there were plenty of other writers who were writing kind of similarish things at the time. So yeah, there's definitely different ways in, in which it comes up. Um, I think you can you can worry too much about it. Like that, so in that case, it seems pretty clear that Rachel Carson contributed quite substantially to the environmentalism yeah. movement. Um, and it it sort of depends on what you're your goals are and how you anticipate having impact. If you anticipate impact, if you think about impact in terms of the next five, 10 years, then Rachel Carson undoubtedly did something amazing for the environmentalism movement. If you're thinking, did she genuinely alter the trajectory? You know, did she make the environmentalism movement uh, sort of happen, whereas it otherwise wouldn't have happened? That seems much less likely to me. Um, But there are sometimes ways in which these kind of speed up effects can be super important as well and can have kind of long run effects and indirect effects. Um, right. Another another kind of thing that I would point out about the replaceability consideration uh, is that it's we can overestimate how much of a limitation that actually presents, uh, especially in areas that have, like I was hinting at before, a smaller number of a smaller number of kind of talented or motivated people applying to relevant opportunities because essentially what you do the kind of indirect effects matter here basically if i were to apply to a particular role in an animal advocacy nonprofit, even if i got that role it might be that the, the person who narrowly missed out then just applies to another animal advocacy nonprofit role and they're the best candidate in that instance and so it's, it's essentially you're still having this effect of kind of like increasing the if you're the person who gets hired you're having this effect of kind of increasing like the average ability of the highest yeah. candidates in roles in that space. So we shouldn't, you know, replaceability doesn't mean that if there was anybody else who'd get the job, you're own you're literally only adding this the however much better you are than than they would be at the role. Um, there are these kind of indirect effects that mean that it count it should count for something more than that. <laughs> so we right. can overestimate. Yeah, the problem and I also I mean sometimes wonder. Uh, I think replaceability uh, is quite. And rightfully discussed in effective altruism community. But I feel whether if everyone thinks of the same way, uh, something essential won't get done. Uh, because it, it seems like a central core principle and there seems to be some sort of uh, weird game theoretic considerations where everyone believes that this would anyway happen and nobody would do that, right? Yeah, so one thing to bear in mind here is it's partly what I just said about it not actually eliminating all the impact, but also just that it's a consideration uh, amongst many, right? And so, so one implication might be if you become less optimistic about a particular career path because of replaceability, that doesn't mean that everything becomes less useful. It can often mean, for instance, that it, there are times when replaceability work, seems like it works in favor of a particular role. So one obvious one would be donating money. If you work in a really high paid role, and that person who would who would otherwise have got that job would have just spent what the kind of average person spends their higher salary on, you know, like 
eating out in restaurants more often or a flashy car or whatever it is they can afford with their high salary. Um, if you essentially take that role and use that money for other purposes, then that's that money wouldn't have gone to the, the causes you direct it to otherwise often. Uh, another example might be if you're an academic who redirects your focus towards something that has more concrete implications for doing good in the world and uh, using your kind of potential for advocacy from your expert credibility and those sorts of things. Or if you have a policy role and then you use that opportunity to kind of um, share certain ideas or kind of um, influence, even just gradually influencing the culture within governmental organizations and stuff like that, that if you weren't that person doing that, um, depending on the role, obviously, it it's fairly unlikely that somebody else would have been having that form of impact. Right. You know, they might have been doing a great job at their policy role. and But the idea is hopefully you're good at that and you've got these other benefits yeah. which have important indirect consequences for the world. Right. So what, what you're saying is that uh, it's just not just plain vanilla replaceability, but what you bring as a person, the extra attributes to that job, uh, is they, they matter a lot. Uh, oh, 100%. I mean, I think those, those examples I were giving were to demonstrate the idea that the replaceability consideration makes some options seem less promising, but other options seem more promising. But it's also true that kind of the other point I was hinting at is that there are several considerations. And even if replaceability decreases your optimism about a particular role, it could still be one of the most important roles that you could do. It could still be the best option for you. For example, if the, just the impact potential of the role is so high, uh, if you imagine, I mean, let's just take a silly example. Uh, if you imagine, actually, no, no, let's go for something slightly more concrete head like you know ceo or executive director of say like the largest or most influential charity in a particular area so uh, let's imagine a, a really major animal advocacy organization even though you're replaceable in the sense that somebody else would probably get that role if you don't get it if you're the best candidate for that role that's got that role is just so important because it's going to affect so many things about the way the the whole space works and the impact on so many animals or people in dire poverty or whatever it is your cause area is focusing on um that even that even a small improvement in the kind of just just by virtue of you being slightly better at that job or doing what it is you're trying to do it uh, more successfully right. can be super important basically so there are a bunch of different kind of career strategy implications uh sorry considerations that we should try to take into account and not be <laughs> it's true that the replaceability one can be demoralizing if you've got <laughs> your path set on your mind set on certain parts or something like that but yeah just yeah. to point out that there, there are plenty of alternatives and then even with that consideration i think the just on the i guess on the motivation point the impact potential one is one that's often underestimated you know people because because of things like scope neglect and various biases that we have it's just hard to imagine just how important some roles can be and just how much impact they can have uh, the 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 scale of the achievement from animal advocacy nonprofits is just astounding the number of animals that people are often able to affect from fairly small amounts of work we're talking for example with with organizations that focus on animal welfare improvements so you know this isn't this isn't like saving lives per se it's moving or sorry moving animals from essentially bad conditions to very slightly less bad conditions but just by virtue of the the sheer number of animals that they can affect and if we're focusing on these kind of short-term effects um if you manage to get a company that affects millions of animals in the supply chain to change that you're having a, a massive amount of of positive yeah. impact so I, I think people just can't is everyone does this it's very hard to comprehend yeah. just this the scale of these effects that, that these organizations really have um so yeah, hopefully that is a kind of counterbalancing right. motivation or factor yeah. <laughs> to the yeah. I mean, like like you were role, saying, so. uh, teaching say ten students feels very concrete mm -hmm. that you're making a difference. But perhaps changing or being part of a movement which changing is changes regulations for mm -hmm. farmed animals uh, that affects billions of animals. Mm -hmm. That that doesn't sort of uh, I mean you don't feel that in the gut, but the impact is ultimately several orders of magnitude more if you truly care about making the world a better place. Yeah, it can be. But I guess this scale consideration, there are kind of different dimensions of that as well. Like you could think of it still being a small number, uh, but just like extremely important. And so one example might be, uh, I mentioned before, like very large numbers, very small change, but you could go the opposite way and you could think like a very small number uh, a, a massive change and it being super important or like even in the teaching example you could imagine somebody who's teaching like if there's a some kind of class to uh 
future political leaders of several countries in one place <laughs> like that would probably quite be quite impactful kind of uh, assuming right. you're doing something that's useful as opposed to something that's counterproductive so there are ways in which it's not just about a raw numbers game there are ways in which um just that it's a kind of broader importance consideration right there. yeah so uh jimmy i wanted to discuss um this debate around humans versus animals and who you should help i know you felt uh, sort of naturally inclined towards animals but as an effective altruist uh, you need to defend why you're not focused on helping humans who might be suffering from poverty or some health condition versus helping animals and how do you defend that yeah well I, the first thing i want to say is that these causes are all important right um and i think sometimes uh, this kind of prioritization exercise again can either be demoralizing or come across as a bit callous but it's not intended to be callous it's intended to think we want to help let's help as much as possible so the first thing i want to say is just like <laughs> what i'm about to say does not denigrate the work that is being done on these super important causes you know if you can help people move out of poverty uh, and move into a, from from a a diff a very difficult life to a slightly less difficult life then that's super important that's amazing if you can save lives of people in countries where uh, their lives are at risk for preventable factors then that is amazing work so i'm not trying to knock that down um and that's you know these are these are real things and these are real individuals we're talking about even when i'm talking about numbers we're talking about big numbers of individual animals so i want to just get that across um in terms of why i prioritize it well to be bluntly honest i like i said i came at effective altruism from an animal advocacy perspective uh, so i had this kind of these kind of personal and emotional reasons which i don't necessarily endorse as like good reasons to prioritize this uh, so you could say there's maybe some bias there although my my views are changing on this um so i suspect it's not that i'm entirely doing this purely due to <laughs> due to just having come from that context but um the kind of the key sort of heuristics that we can use to compare different cause areas Uh, one is the kind of scale thing which is what we've been talking about mostly so far and so that includes like i say it includes numbers of individuals affected uh, it includes kind of intensity of experience or potential all these various ways in which something can be more or less important and so one thing that we've touched on is just the sheer number of animals you know centers institutes research we have this page on estimates of the number of animals kept in farmed conditions at any one time which is a different stat to what you're quite often the ones shared around the number of animals slaughtered sorted in a year but if you think about the number of animals at any one time and specifically in factory farm conditions animals who are kept in close confinement it's just unimaginable numbers um we're talking about land animals and i'm going to get the numbers wrong so don't quote me on these specific numbers but it's something in the region of sort of 30 billion land animals kept in farmed conditions at any one time if you count sea animals then the estimates the it becomes much less clear because there's worse data but it's somewhere you know the kind of midpoint estimate is is in excess of 100 billion animals in farmed conditions at any one time and that is just absurd you know we're talking about more than 10 times the number of humans uh for every human there's like 10 animals suffering in horrendous farmed conditions at any one point so there's this huge scale consideration um and obviously as i just hinted at you know of the of the however many people we've got in the world it's something like 8 billion isn't it uh only a proportion of those are in global po- are in kind of extreme poverty and so we're talking i last time i no actually i'm not going to say it because i'll get it wrong <laughs> but like i say these are not negligible numbers this is a horrendous ongoing problem but just the the scale for me weighs in in favor of prioritize that consideration alone weighs in favor of uh prioritizing focusing on animals um there are ways you could disagree with that certainly you could think for example that the the animals warrant lower sort of moral consideration per individual just like the the extent of their capacities for positive or negative experiences are lower than humans or something like that and i think that's probably true at least to some extent but i think people sometimes overestimate the differences between different species and this is not something i'm an expert on despite the name of the organization i work for i'm not an expert on like sentience per se and kind of like the capacities of different animals but i will say that the more i read about it the more i converged on the on the equivalence between at least some animals and humans and it just be me not being able to justify that there are these massive differences between them um it you can kind of you can put arguments about intelligence to one side and think if a human or an animal is suffering the same kind of physical pain you know whether they can sort of comprehend you know what they'll do in 3 days time or not whether they can be upset about certain emotional things 
uh, and kind of intellectual things just seems irrelevant. If they're in suffering intense, severe pain, then that is extremely concerning for me, whatever their shape is, you know, assuming they've got the, the kind of neurological and biological things that enable that pain to be felt and important to them. Um, so yeah, I don't think there's a massive difference there. So that's the scale consideration, which to me weighs in favor of focusing on farmed animals. There's also this kind of intensity of experience thing. And you could say that you might think that some suffering in factory farms, at least, is extremely intense and it's essentially chronic. It's all the time. Um, you know, we won't get into the details of <laughs> saying who's suffering worse at any one point, but that's a relevant consideration as well. OK, so scale. The next consideration is this kind of um, is this neglectedness idea. Who else is working on it? And again, I think this weighs quite heavily in favour of focusing on helping animals. And so the idea here is that. Well, there's one way to compare this is just by looking at sheer numbers of donations. And that's quite a nice quantitative thing that you can compare. And the numbers are just, there's just many orders of magnitude difference, essentially. Uh, yeah, if we think about the, so so there, there are not currently good exact numbers on the amount of donations that go to animal advocacy, uh, but there have been some estimates by informed people that are probably not too far off. Um, and so they have kind of estimated, if, if I remember correctly, is something in the realm of kind of 200 billion uh, dollar, US dollars per year going towards helping farmed animals. Um, and that's kind of specifically the sort of nonprofit stuff. And so that sounds like quite a lot. Um, again, you know, these big numbers are hard to imagine and compare. Uh, yeah. But if we compare it to uh, the amount of money that's being spent on trying to fix global poverty, and you think about all the international aid and all that sort of thing, um, then the essentially, yeah, the, the numbers are far higher. And uh, yeah, I'm just trying to see if I can get, get the numbers so I don't get them wrong. But I can't yeah. find them quickly. I'm, I'm but... <laughs> sure. I mean, it's, it must be in tri trillions. So I mean, at least. Yeah. So that... it's a, yeah, exactly. So if you think about this, just on that kind of rough comparison idea, the um, yeah, just the like the idea behind this neglectedness consideration is that if there's not much money going towards something, if there's not many people working on it, uh, there's probably more low hanging fruit. You know opportunities for easy victories that haven't been taken because they just haven't been explored as fully. So for me, that pushes in favor of this uh, animal advocacy consideration as well. You can think of kind of human biases that are at play. And certainly there are biases in play that push against people working on global poverty. And that includes things like, you know, obviously there's like sort of racism and nationalism and just generally just being more willing to help those people around you, which is arguably a bias, arguably justifiable, whatever. Um, but I, Certainly this kind of speciesism consideration, which is uh, essentially a bias against sentient beings from other yeah. species, has been kind of increasingly studied in formal academic psychology and is demonstrated in a number of contexts and yet yeah, appears to predict uh, attitudes towards animals in a number of different contexts, that sort of thing. And so that's very prevalent. And I expect that to be more enduring in the sense that I think we have to fight harder against our essentially evolutionary instincts uh, to to extend our compassion and consideration towards beings who look and sound and smell and everything else entirely different from us rather than just kind of some minor superficial <laughs> differences essentially yeah. so that again those kind of long-term problems i expect the neglect in this aspect to continue to push in favor of uh, working on animals over kind of this global poverty consideration uh, right. the third factor which is important for weighing up causes is this idea of tractability. Can we actually do anything to solve the problem, make headway on it? And there, I, I actually think this is where the case for farmed animal work is weaker than the case for uh, working to help global poverty. Uh, because the evidence base is worse, yeah. we have less clear, we, we, we don't have many detailed, uh, controlled experiments in farmed animal work that we have in the case of global poverty work. And so, for instance, there's been uh, these randomized control trials of things like giving money to people who are in extreme poverty and seeing what they do with it and seeing if it leads to better life outcomes. And the finding is it seems to do that. 
Uh, so that's a nice, clear example. It's very hard to get these kind of real world studies in animal advocacy. Um, that said, there are a number of really promising things which are going on all the time. And so I do still think this work is very tractable. It's just we have less strong evidence for it, you know, less very clear evidence. So, for instance, I mentioned the animal welfare stuff. If you kind of estimate just the, the cost and the, the effort that's gone into uh, just securing these massive victories for animals that have been increasing in kind of magnitude over the past few years, uh, then it seems very, very promising. Uh, it seems like work has been done. Another kind of clear example of the of work that is tractable that helps animals is work on animal product alternatives. And I, I saw you had a conversation re recently with Baron from the Good Food Institute, and that's the kind of yeah. work that that he and others are working on. There's, of course, the, the, the startups working on that, actually producing the products, but the market for those products is growing really rapidly, and it's just really impressive. And it's another demonstration that there is work that can be done that helps animals. Um, so from yeah. those three things, you know, scale, I think leans in favor of working on animals. Neglectedness, I think, leans in favor of working on animals. Tractability, uh, maybe leans slightly in favor of working on global poverty. But when you consider all those things together and kind of estimate what work is most cost effective overall to do good in the world, then for me, it comes out quite strongly in favor of uh, working to help animals. Right. So, Jamie, I wanted to uh, dig more on tractability. Uh, mm -hmm. My understanding has been. I mean, I look at the number of animals slaughtered graph on this website, all our world in data, and it just keeps going up. I think it shows about 70 billion chickens are slaughtered every year and every year there's an increase. And I, I guess I was also reading a report that said uh, the number of say, vegans in Western countries hasn't really changed in last uh, 20 years or so. It's been about 1, 1.5% 1, of the entire population. Uh, you know, I mean, prima facie, this seems demoralizing that um, because animal advocacy is not new. I mean, there have been uh, attempts towards better animal sort of outcomes and so on for so, so much of time. But it just seems uh, the population at large is is not changing. I mean, what's your view on this? Do you, do you get uh, demoralized uh, by... Hmm? this these facts yeah yeah i mean they're certainly concerning and they point to the continued importance of the problem that this is not going away automatically in the near future and we have to keep working on it uh, in terms of like whether that is a signal that it's not tractable i do think it's a signal yes um but i think there's a lot of things going into that 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 trend that we see so for example an important one is just growing continued to grow growing population um you could think that we were making progress like you could imagine that the average i'm not saying this is the case but you can imagine for example that average consumption is going down and just by virtue of population the overall consumption continues to increase but then at some point um, continue to make progress then the trend will change um so uh, yeah there's just so many different things going into that end figure that i don't think that is strong evidence that things we're doing yeah. so far aren't working at all I do think that like this argument, the, the kind of conventional tactics that have been used in to help animals, at least to help farmed animals, have often been this approach of focus on individual diet change. And that is an area that I think is, like I said, there's evidence that it works. You know, it can change. You can change people's diets, uh, but it's just very hard and it just takes a lot of resources. Uh, and this comes from a, a number of basically this is part of a wider trend where work to change attitudes and behaviors at the collective societal level tends to be a lot higher leverage and easier to achieve for the, in terms of the results you, you get than this kind of working individual by individual, trying to encourage them to change their attitudes towards something and then consequently change what they actually do. So there's like the two part battle there that we were talking about yeah. before about putting the information out there and then actually ensuring it happens. Um, it's just, it is very hard. And so, some some examples of evidence in favor of this kind of institutional approach so one is historical you know we have we can look at past social movements that have had comparable social sorry society altering goals and there don't seem to be many social movements that have been very successful with a primarily kind of individual consumer change focus i guess the best the best example we can probably give is the environmentalism movement where recycling has become very widespread um, and it has 
massively increased. But even there, it's unclear whether this was the best use of time and a lot of environmentalists are not keen on the, on the tactics. If we compare that to, there are plenty of social movements we can look at where we seem to, there seem to have been quite a lot of resources expended on this kind of individual behavioral or potentially just attitudinal change. And yet there don't seem to have been very promising results that have come out of this. Um, yeah, so one example would be the the anti-abortion movement, where there's this effort to reduce people's decision to uh, end their pregnancies, essentially. And that has involved, in the US at least, where I've looked at it, has involved a lot of kind of approaching women and trying to encourage, discourage them from going through with abortions. It involved a lot of education campaigns, stuff like that. There's various tactics, but there's very little evidence that's actually achieved anything. Um, it seems some of the some of the kind of legislative tactics that the anti-abortion movement have tried ha seem to have had stronger effects on reducing the incidence of abortion. So we don't seem to see where resources have been spent on these tactics. They don't seem to have had very substantial effects. There's also evidence from the anti-death penalty movement and some of the other movements we've looked at, which is all written up on the Institute's website, but won't go through every single detail. <laughs> um, in contrast, we, we do sometimes see examples of where um, movements have or organizations have kind of shifted their tactics, have been trying these sorts of things, seen that it hasn't really worked and gone towards other tactics which seem to be more successful. So a good example of this is the US anti-slavery movement, where there, at first there was this very substantial focus on there was this very substantial focus on getting individuals to just give up slave made goods entirely you know, not buy anything made by slaves, which was very tough at the time because so many yeah. things were made by slaves. And it just didn't really achieve numbers. Uh, it didn't really get much participation at all. And after a couple of decades of struggling with this tactic, which they were initially very optimistic about, the the movement against slavery essentially split into various factions, one of which focused on political campaigns and was instrumental in the kind of formation of the Republican Party, which tied in with the Civil War and some other things to probably play quite uh, at least some part in the emancipation of, uh, sorry, the abolition of slavery in America. So we do see these kind of shifts. Um, so yeah, this is just one type of evidence that we have for this claim that essentially it's easier, uh, well, easier is perhaps the wrong word because it requires kind of substantial investment, but overall, all things considered, a better use of time and resources to focus on these kind of institutional tactics. Uh, I'll, right. I'll give one more example just to kind of clarify this point, which is that you mentioned the kind of number of people going vegetarian or vegan. And in the US, the numbers are still very small. You know, if we look at it, it tends, it's exact numbers are hard to come, uh, hard to kind of converge on exactly how many people it is, but it's some, probably below 5%. If you compare that to surveys we've done at Sentence Institute of the US population about their attitudes towards whether they would support policies that do m really major changes like abolishing factory farming. And given that factory farming constitutes something like 99% of all farmed animals in America, that is near equivalent to abolishing animal, animal farming. Um, we've asked them about abolishing, sorry, uh, banning uh, slaughterhouses. And both of those two questions, once you exclude people who said no, no opinion, is nearly 50% support okay. for those things. It's You can do various manipulations that make it seem lower and you can say, oh, well, maybe there's all these things that mean that we can't interpret it exactly as 50%. And I'd agree with that, but it's still a much higher proportion than you probably expect based on the number of vegetarians and vegans alone. It suggests that people are willing to support these major societal changes if they can kind of, you know, it's a part of a collective effort. They can externalize the blame and it can be like, as a society, we need to do this rather than saying, well, I've been doing this incorrect thing all my life and I need to go through all these steps to change it. Uh, so essentially, yeah, this, this idea that these kind of institutional changes seem more tractable. Um, and as I say, it's something we've done quite a lot of research on. Uh, if people want to dig into that, I'd recommend we have a page on our website called the Foundational Questions in Effective Animal Advocacy, which lists out a number of these kind of key strategic questions like institutional versus individual tactics, like uh, confrontational versus non-confrontational tactics, and just kind of summarizes some of the most important arguments and evidence on either side of those debates. Yeah, I mean, I love going through that page. It's uh, <laughs> really thorough. I'll definitely put a link to it uh, in the podcast notes. Uh, but I'm very surprised about the survey uh, where so many people support something which they would not follow if the regulation wasn't there. Uh, what's your hypothesis about this difference? I mean, it seems like a 10x difference between what people support and what they ultimately do in their individual life. Yeah, I mean, I think there's a bunch of things there. So like one 
um, one way of thinking about this is that if you are in a predominantly non-vegetarian society and you want to go vegetarian, it takes, you know, a lot of vegetarians and vegans will tell you it's super easy and you can do it if you're motivated, but not everybody is really motivated to do it. It's something they think they probably should do, but they, you know, it, you, it's, it's, it's still difficult enough that they won't do it. If you alter the conditions that it's no longer super difficult for them to do it, um, then they maybe they would just do it kind of by default. You know, people, uh, there's only, you know, people don't tend to kind of um, push against social norms in uh, as proactively as that. So you can imagine that somebody would think, yeah, we should change this. Like, I agree. I just don't have the motivation or it's too difficult or all those sorts of things. Um, so it's, uh, it's partly that, I think, these practical factors, that if you alter the conditions of the, in, in which people live, then they would make those changes. But right. in the current world, they haven't, and they probably won't in the near future if conditions stay the same. I think there's also what I hinted at before with this, this kind of moral outrage thing, which is where if you imply, like, it's the government's fault, you know, it's society's fault, as opposed to, like, you as an individual have done a bad thing all this time, then people are much more willing to get behind those sorts of things. And uh, this, this isn't a purely theoretical thing. This is a thing that results in actions you know actions as small as like signing a petition or voting one way or another but those actions can have real world consequences so that that difference in attitude can be super important right um so so jamie if if a listener of this podcast uh, wants to start their career in animal advocacy uh what how would you guide that person to be most effective and i know you have the entire uh, website of uh, your nonprofit towards that but just at a very high level, how should they think about being effective at animal advocacy? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, I'm trying to think what's the most coherent way to answer this concisely, because the problem is with these career consideration things is that they affect people, that everyone's situation is different. And I mentioned different kind of career strategy considerations. And one very important one is your personal fit. And relatedly, is kind of what's your advantage compared to other people who have similar goals to you. And these things are very personally dependent. You know, if you've already invested 20 years into a particular career, like you're some kind of marketing expert or you're, you know, you've you've developed excellent expertise in kind of behind the scenes, sorting out operations at companies or doing hiring or whatever it is, um, then it doesn't make a lot of sense for you to switch entirely, even if something seems like in a completely neutral world where you had all kind of imaginable skills to an equal level, uh, something else would seem more promising. That's not the real world. The real world, you have to take those personal factors into consideration. So I do think there are all these important kind of career considerations and there's no one-stop shop answer that I can give. Um, so what that pushes in favor of is spending some time thinking about it and working it out and, and actually investing that time. And even kind of like what seems like a very small time investment can potentially make a massive difference. If you consider that there are these big differences in just like as the impact potential example I gave earlier with, if you imagine like a manager at an important organization or somebody who's like donating huge amounts of money to organizations. And then you compare that to somebody who's like, uh, well, I don't want to put anyone down, but <laughs> doing something that's like, uh, you can imagine it's not that they're not very well suited to it or it's not a particularly important role. It's just kind of like done something to give them something to fill their time with or something like that. So there are very big differences. Um, so uh, yeah, and the idea being that spending some time kind of career planning, if you can make shifts that potentially mean a, a big difference in the impact you're able to achieve, then that time is very worth investing. So the answer in terms of like, what I actually recommend is essentially, as you say, have a look at the website. We've got a page uh, called Glossary of Terms, which summarizes some of, the, some of these kind of, uh, career strategy considerations I've been talking about. We also last year ran an online course to kind of walk people through the details of kind of where the animal advocacy movement is at at the moment and integrate some of these career strategy considerations. We haven't launched it publicly yet, but we're it's looking very likely that we're going to do at least one other kind of cohort of that online course later this year. So uh, depending when you put this <laughs> when you put this episode out, uh, people should definitely see if that's available at the, at the time. And if not, just kind of subscribe to our newsletter and we'll probably advertise it in the near future. Because, yeah, as I say, kind of work, working through understanding those considerations and then seeing how they apply to your own situation is super important. Right. Right. So related question to this, uh, Jamie, is um, uh, I, I was going through what you've written and one of the things that struck me uh, 
was that sometimes uh, animal advocates end up doing things that actually harm the advocacy movement. For example, maybe things around, say, being very flashy or confrontational, uh, particularly some of the movements uh, have have developed a public image which is uh, which is slightly repulsive to other parts of the society. Uh, so, can you elaborate more on that? You know, what what is that animal advocates can do unintentionally uh, that ultimately sort of harms the entire movement? Yeah, um, I mean, there are plenty of things you could do which accidentally have kind of indirect <laughs> negative consequences. Uh, yeah, so. I, several examples are jumping to mind. I'm trying to think which would be most sort of coherent to summarize now. You mentioned the controversial tactics example and the kind of confrontational tactics. And to be clear, I do think that confrontational tactics, at least at times, have a place in the movement. Um, and uh, by, to clarify, I don't mean um, like violent tactics. I mean confrontational as in it could be, for example, doing a public protest to encourage an institution to switch something. So I do think that they can have an important role in that sort of thing. You know, if you've already got uh, public support for a particular change and this is just about pressuring an institution to actually make that switch and introduce the new rules or whatever it is, then I do think that confrontational tactics can often be worthwhile. But there are other ways in which they could be counterproductive. And so uh, the, the violent tactics is an example there. Um, this is something that in the UK, uh, animal advocates are, at least many I've spoken to, are, are very regretful that the animal advocacy movement in sort of the 90s did have this violent edge, which has kind of caused these long term difficulties for the movement um, and substantially reduced its credibility in various ways. Another example there would be the anti abortion movement that I mentioned before in the US that's kind of notorious for its various violent tactics and confrontational tactics. And at least there's some evidence that this has kind of decreased credibility of the movement. Uh, and potentially support and potentially some kind of institutional changes have been more made more difficult. A very obvious example of how it, how these tactics can result in problems is because they can lead to legal restrictions on the activism from that movement. And so in the case of the anti-abortion movement, there were in restrictions introduced like you can't get within a certain distance of an abortion clinic uh, and oh. do certain protests or something like that. So there's these, you know, it's very clear that they did protests and confrontation at them and they were restricted from doing that because uh, because it kind of alienated decision makers. So that's an example of where it could be very negative in the kind of immediate short term for a movement. Another example, which is, so at Sentence Institute, I haven't really kind of spoken very much about these kind of considerations because it just adds a lot of complexity, but we're actually, our main kind of driving focus is thinking, is kind of strategizing for how to have the most positive effects we can on the very long-term future. And so that includes ensuring that the animal advocacy movement is kind of sustainable and successful. Um, and actually this is in my, so I also run a podcast with the Sentence Institute and in the most recent episode, which we released yesterday, I was discussing with Tobias Bauman from the Center of Reducing Suffering about what he thinks are the most important kind of changes that somebody should make if they have these kind of long-term goals for the movement, as well as just kind of helping animals as much as we can in the short term. Uh, and one, one idea that he is quite keen on is that we avoid um, making the, it kind of similar to what you were touching on, is that we avoid making the movement uh, divisive or kind of repugnant in some ways. And this is essentially like, for example, if we continue to use especially polarizing tactics, or even potentially if we just aligned very clearly with one kind of political ideology over others, uh, that it could become that it, it adopts this continuously kind of confrontational dynamic. And that could at times be beneficial, but the idea is that longer term, that could be very problematic, especially, I mean, for instance, if, if it resulted in, if for instance, you'd allied with a particular ideology and then that ideology uh, for essentially unrelated reasons suffers and, and loses out and then the animal advocacy movement is kind of inextricably tied with that then the movement and its ideas could not only be discredited but vilified um you can you know you can think of you can think of some alternative scenarios where it works out especially well but it seems and on and essentially an unacceptable risk and a, not one we'd, we'd want to kind of endorse if we can avoid it. So that's another example of how these kinds of, there are, there are things you could do which could have negative effects. I think you mentioned, I think you were referring to, there's this kind of publicity stunt 
example. Yeah. Um, and this is one that I've been thinking about recently, which is where partly there's just a credibility thing here um, and reducing the credibility of the movement, giving it less support, those sorts of things. Another one that I've been thinking about is actually just that awareness of the movement. And I mentioned that kind of, we're often assuming that just putting education and ideas out there is all you need. But for some movements, and at some certainly at some times, increased awareness could actually be a bad thing. Um, and so an example of this is that some of the research I've been reviewing recently on kind of attitude change suggests that if people are more informed about a particular topic, it tends to be harder to change their mind because they've already got relevant evidence and opinions and those sort of things. They've committed to a position that if somebody knows more about a topic, it's hard to change their mind in another direction. So you might think that if the if people are very aware of animal advocacy because they've seen these kinds of you know, silly gimmicky stunts or whatever it is. And so they've thought about the topic and they've just concluded, well, that's a ridiculous idea because the only evidence they have in favor of the change is bad evidence, <laughs> essentially. It's not yeah. convincing. And they kind of come to this conclusion. Then it could become harder to actually change them, change their minds than it actually would have been if that stunt had never happened. So essentially raising awareness is not always good. Um, another example is that, and this is a bit more tenuous, but it could potentially be difficult to, uh, it could be harder to introduce certain institutional changes like legislative changes because, again, it's kind of to do with people committing to a certain position. So you can imagine that if most legislators just don't really care about animal advocacy issues, they think, yeah, fine, get on with it, deal with the deal with the chicken producers or whatever, and I'll just focus on the other things I care about more. Then all it takes is for some kind of, it, it might be easier for some to almost like sneak through legislation. You know, it just, it just takes a few committed advocates who are, policymakers who think this is a very good idea we need to do it to just kind of persuade the others to go along with it so this i mean this is a uh, quite a complex one in the sense that i do think that a lot of the time you know raising awareness is going to be helpful especially if it's like targeted towards a particular campaign but it, it's i'm more raising the point to say that doing things which clearly have negative effects like reducing yeah. credibility i don't think you can justify them purely in terms of increasing awareness and salience like you need to have further reasons to say that that is something we want because actually awareness and savings can have bad effects too. It's not just a universally good thing. Right. I think the meta lesson from this and also the previous point about how to plan one's career is to be really thoughtful of uh, what you're doing and the potential consequences of it. I, I think in a lot of this, um, the, in, in, in some people, you know, the drive to do good is so strong that, uh, the decisions are very emotional and they're driven by, uh, for lack of a better word, impulse. Uh, but like you're saying, there's, there's so many nonlinear effects. So, so much of complexity that even say simple, uh, prima facie good action, like I want to raise awareness can have a negative consequence for the entire movement. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, yeah, it's an unfortunate fact that the world is complex and yeah, as you say, kind of like, uh, the things, the all things considered effects are not the same as the most obvious effects. Uh, so it, yeah, it's, it's a shame that that is the reality. Um, you know, sometimes these indirect indirect effects make things especially positive. So that's a kind of um, a reassuring idea. And a, a, an example of that is is actually, despite kind of what I've been saying, in many ways, what motivates me to work on animal related issues is the knock on effects that I expect this to have. For the long term future, that this is about building a society that considers beings as interests, regardless of what they look like, what they're, um, and all those sorts of things. And that this might not even be farmed animals that this has indirect positive effects for. This might be animals in the wild. This might be any sort of life or being that can have positive or neg negative experiences could indirectly benefit from these actions we take in the near future to the, to encourage moral consideration of animals. So yeah, it both goes both ways. You're right that certain actions can have unintended negative effects, but it's also that if we, as you say, if we think about what the, if we try and work out what some of these ongoing effects can be, some things just become even more promising <laughs> than they right. previously seemed. Or uh, and, and so animal advocacy is very much an example of that. And I think it can have uh, these, these changes we're making in the next, 10, 50, 100 or so years could potentially be very important for in essentially making the world and whatever humans end up doing better in the in the very long term future, just through right. these kind of indirect yeah. mechanisms. Yeah, I, I think that's a great point. But uh, one nuance there is, uh, again, from my readings, uh, I've realized 
many people who try vegetarian uh, diet, they do it for health reasons and they're mm-hmm. not necessarily pro animal welfare. And I think particularly in India, where we have a majority vegetarian population, I was reading one of the surveys and uh, even vegetarian people, because, you know, they're just culturally and uh, through their religion, vegetarian, they're not necessarily pro animal uh, rights or pro animal welfare. So there is this difference between uh, diet being vegetarian and whether you really believe in welfare of non human uh, species. Yeah, I agree. It's certainly not a silver bullet. You know, if we manage to cut animal product consumption out entirely, it doesn't suddenly mean that everyone is automatically, uh, you know, in the uh, kind of in the ideal situation. There is likely some kind of effect there. There's a bunch of kind of psychological evidence suggesting that reducing animal product consumption or cutting out entirely, preferably, would have positive effects on people's attitudes towards towards animals. And so, an example of this. Um, so one one example of the experiment is where people were provided people were provided either snacks and they weren't told what the experiment was about, but they were provided either nuts or they were provided I think it was like beef or something like that, and uh, just took a survey after that and just their attitudes towards animals uh, and the I think it was actually the kind of cognitive capabilities that they described animals as having were higher in the the condition where they'd been eating nuts, snacking on nuts. And so the, the the idea is there's this kind of denial of minds that if you're kind of invested in animal exploitation, essentially, that you're less inclined to accept that they can have these capabilities and that they are worthy of more consideration. Um, Yes, yeah, so that's one example. It's a quite short term thing. Another one, another quite interesting uh, survey, actually, it's not an experiment per se, is where people were asked to rate the capabilities of different animals. And essentially, the, the way this was done was the animals were kind of grouped by category by the researchers afterwards, not the participants weren't told this, but very similar seeming animals, um, very similar seeming animals who weren't farmed, who weren't farmed animals were given were rated as having higher capabilities than similar animals who are farmed and the idea is that this is to do with again this kind of we have these mental associations of animals as being kind of like for consumption or those sorts of things and that means that we grant them less moral consideration or view them as being having lower capabilities and those sorts of things so the the idea is that you know once we've eliminated this barrier this this kind of societal investment in exploiting animals then hopefully there'll be some positive there'll be some positive indirect effects there that we can grant them the the kind of moral consideration that they would deserve yeah. in an ideal world and there's been less less there's less kind of bias in the way there right so this is uh, i mean this is what's generally known as the long term long term is attitude within the community right where and I, I guess i wanted to touch on this point with regards to helping humans i've seen some effective altruists make a case that uh, helping humans is better because humans have so many follow-on effects where they can, uh, I mean, they have culture there, they can invent technology, but if you help an animal, that's about it. There is no follow-on benefits, but your point is that it can definitely have a follow-on benefit wherein our moral circle expands beyond humans. Exactly. Yeah. So it, I'm not suggesting that the reason that there are indirect effects is because the animal will then go on to do other things, um, which is kind of the case, uh, I guess, presumably the argument that might be advanced is some of those human focus causes. I'm, I'm actually suggesting that the positive indirect effects come through changed attitudes and behaviours in human society. But yes, I do think that there are these very important indirect effects from the advocacy we have. And it might not just be through that kind of uh removal of, of barriers you could also there are various other effects that seem to push in favor of this so one there's this evidence of what's been called the secondary transfer effect which is where essentially if somebody increases their moral consideration of a certain type of being it tends to to a lesser extent increase their moral consideration of other types of beings as well and so this idea is that there are these kind of indirect effects that are positive from the advocacy themselves or from the attitude change as it happens um, you could also think there's just a kind of capacity building thing here where it's about building a movement that is focused on granting beings the consideration that they deserve given the capabilities that they have and so you might think that once factory farming is abolished or once we've ended animal farming or whatever your goals that you're striving for are that they, those kind of goals of helping other sentient beings essentially 
can be applied in another context. And there's already this kind of momentum built behind this. And to some extent, you might think that that has been happening over the past few centuries with the expansion of humanity's moral circle that we've already seen with regards to things like um, gender and race and all those sorts of things. And there's some evidence that in some contexts, at least, there's like overlap between these various movements that are pushing on the, the frontiers of humanity's moral circle. So, for example, with the British anti-slavery movement, some of the key advocates in the British anti-slavery movement in the late 19th century were also people who were advocates, uh, sorry, advocating for children's rights and for, um, I believe, women's quality. But yeah, it's not something I, I don't remember exactly, but it's kind of detailed in our report that we've got on our website. So. Yeah, it's kind of anecdotal, but you might think that this kind of capacity building effect could could have positive. Right. I mean, if your point is that if uh, this movement leads to an increase in empathy or compassion, that just has multiplicative benefits just beyond yeah. Uh, animals. Yeah, I guess I'm not necessarily. Yeah, so that is one point. And another point is that the the kind of the people and the infrastructure that is created towards achieving this goal mm, if you okay. imagine the goal is not necessarily just like helping farmed animals it's expanding humanity's moral circle uh then even if the movement kind of changes shape a little bit once certain goals are achieved or whatever then the capacity is there and the ability to then take it to the next step or whatever the next challenge that is needed to to advance that broader goal uh, that the same kind of infrastructure would carry over Right. So, uh, Jamie, uh, when it comes to learning from history, the social movements, uh, I guess one of the differences uh, that animal advocacy movement is that animals can't speak up for themselves. They can't protest. Uh, so what lessons can we import given that uh, it is essentially, a, a re I mean, in one sense, quite different from what has happened before in terms of, say, anti-slavery or women's right or children's right and so on, where uh, these beings themselves, these people could protest, but animals obviously cannot. Yeah, you're absolutely right to highlight that as an important factor that kind of reduces the comparability of at least some social movements with the farm animal movement and therefore reduces the, the weight that we can place on any particular strategic implication we might draw from that. Um, and so, for example, yeah, the example you give there about them being an advocate for themselves, for example, you might think that like that makes it that should make us slightly more skeptical that certain tactics that were used in, say, the US civil rights movement would translate across equally, because that was a movement which was driven substantially, if not exclusively, by the essentially the underprivileged groups themselves, the groups that were seeking to be included more strongly in yeah. the moral circle. Um, and so you might, for an example of where this might make it difficult to draw analogies is say certain controversial tactics. And we were talking about con confrontational tactics before. You might think that in the case of where it is the oppressed, the oppressed themselves doing that, then that in itself elicits sympathy. And so like a classic tactic in civil rights in the civil rights movement was where the protesters kind of intentionally drew, it's almost like encouraged violence against them in order to get media coverage, elicit sympathy. That probably doesn't work. So that part of why that works, and this is essentially intuitive, you know, this is not like, I don't have strong scientific evidence or anything, but part of why that works is, is likely because it's symbolic of the problem itself. You know, you're on TV as, as oppressing the oppressed and they're saying, look, we're oppressed. It makes it very credible. In the case of animal advocates, if you see police kind of arresting animal advocates or even beating them, um, it doesn't demonstrate the problem in the same concrete way. It doesn't say, yeah. look, animals are oppressed. It just says these protesters were like attacked or whatever. Yeah. Um, so I do think that's a very important consideration. And that's essentially a key part of why we have selected the social movements that we have selected to analyze in our social movement research is that they're all what we call ally-based movements. And this is essentially where they have that exact feature you just discussed of where the movement is at least primarily driven by people who are not the intended beneficiaries of the movement. And so you mentioned and slavery as an example, and that's a, it's a kind of a surprising one because certainly slaves played a role in putting pressure on the, on the institution. There were revol slave revolts, um, and for instance, shortly before, not, not long before slavery was abolished in the UK, sorry, at least the slave trade was abolished in the UK, there was a revolt in uh, in St. Dominique, now Haiti, uh, one of the kind of major, it was a French, French slave kind of colony, but yeah, a very major revolt. And there's all these kind of pressures from that. But that said, within kind of British society itself, a lot of the drive for anti-slavery 
uh, advocacy came from white people, essentially, people who were yeah. not slaves themselves. And so it's this kind of ally-based movement. Uh, slaves had very little direct political voice, which is why the forms of advocacy that seem to have had pressure is that is the is the, essentially the uprisings uh, because they weren't you know they weren't given a platform to speak in parliament for example in in most cases right so that's an example of yeah surprisingly it's quite it's quite ally driven um, that movement a more obvious example is is this is partly why we chose the anti-abortion movement despite it you know people often associate it with a kind of conservative social agenda whereas animal advocacy is more neutral or potentially slightly more liberal or whatever. Um, so different goals in some ways, but clearly <laughs> fetuses, human uh, unborn yeah. children cannot advocate for themselves. So any advocacy that has been done has been done by allies of the of the fetuses, I suppose. Um, and so, yeah, that is why we focus on movements where uh, the intended beneficiaries are not the advocates or at least aren't the kind of the majority of the advocates. Right, right. Um, I... I... I, I didn't realize, uh, I was assuming you had included uh, uh, many social movements, uh, but having this filter of uh, making sure we're learning lessons from allies based social movements, I think that makes total sense. Yeah, to, to jump in, I do think we can still learn lessons from movements which aren't ally based, like it just makes the evidence weaker, basically. So from our perspective, as researchers, we kind of prioritize the most comparable movements. And so there are, there are various ways in which a movement is going to be more or less comparable to the movement that we're focused on, uh, the farm down movement, or even other movements kind of pushing on expansion of humanity's moral circle. Um, and so there's never it's never an exact comparison. And so I think all that does is it means that for certain conclusions, you might be more, you might place more or less weight on that strategic implication. I do think that we can learn lessons nonetheless, and especially if a lesser, if a kind of particular cause and effect relationship seems to crop up in several similar movements, then that is quite strong evidence to my mind. And that's why I recently released a post called uh, Key Lessons from Social Movement History, which is where it's focusing on particularly paying attention to any of those kind of repeat findings from across movements. Because then if it seems to happen consistently, then it's like, yeah, so there might be differences in this instance and differences in that instance. But if it's happening consistently, it kind of, um, th those differences seem less capable of explaining how that effect is, is happening because they're not the same difference in each case, basically. Right. Okay. Uh, so Jamie, um, I want to touch a bit on artificial sentience uh, in the, um, in, in the sentient institute, you talk about expanding the moral circle beyond humans. And uh, I think animals is very intuitive and obvious. A uh, lot of people will agree to that. Uh, but when it comes to artificial, artificial sentience, uh, I guess we still don't understand uh, the causal mechanism for sentience. So how do you, I mean, in that case, isn't the job really difficult? How do you identify what piece of software is sentient or not and I, I know i'm asking a really hard question and they may not be a straightforward answer but i would love to sort of pick your brains on how do you approach this question of what software should we include in our moral circle and what should we exclude yeah i mean that is a very tough question and to be bluntly honest it's not a question i foresee us having a clear answer to um for a very long time if ever um my case for working on this is not that I am very confident that certain types of beings already warrant moral consideration, or even that they will in the near future, is that it's plausible to me that some of these entities will, and that it comes back to the numbers argument, that the numbers could potentially be so huge. So I'm going to just back backtrack a little bit and think about just kind of the... So I mentioned before the kind of scale as being one, one important heuristic that would affect whether we think a cause is important. And if we think about just like the size of human population to date, at the moment it's 8 billion. Um, if I recall correctly, uh, it's if you count up all human life that has existed so far, is something in the realms of 100 billion. It might be yeah. more, it's not the exact stat. Um, but the point is that future life, given that we're now at this large population, it does, if you think, if you imagine that humanity will keep existing even just on this planet, until the planet is no longer inhabitable, then that is an extremely long time. It's you know it's yeah. many millions of years, and if the population keeps going, then humans themselves will keep 
existing for there's going to be a huge number of human lives um going forwards and it's just like i can't even tell you the numbers and they're hard to imagine like if you put if you kind of represent a figure on the screen with one human life sorry a billion human lives as one as one person then it takes up many screens worth many 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 screens worth just to represent on earth alone and this is this is actually a being written about this this kind of graphic demonstration is from a forthcoming book by William McCaskill um, called What We Owe the Future. Um, so, yeah, th the point is that the human future alone is potentially absolutely massive in scale. Um, and if we imagine that humans might be able to go beyond this planet as well and potentially colonize other planets in the long term future, and potentially they will have uh, very powerful computers, artificial intelligence, and so on, that makes this just the scale of human life very large indeed. Uh, if we then kind of why this is pretend, why this links into the artificial entities idea is that along with the massive scale of human life, there could be an absolutely massive scale in artificial life and we can come back to it in a second to whether it counts as life or not um but you can imagine with those kind of computing powers that i that i just discussed you could have very many kinds of computers and sort of processes within those computers that are very complex and that potentially we think should warrant more consideration and so an example of this would be in a simulation and so you can imagine if there is a human that if there's a human that is essentially digital, you know, everything like we know humans to be, but it's just run on a computer because it's just a very, very complicated, uh, very powerful computer in the future that they can run these very accurate simulations. Uh, then I think probably most of us, the, the intuitive answer is that that being has moral worth. You know, it's the same as us, essentially, just because it's on a computer, it doesn't matter too much. Uh, there's actually an argument by Nick Bostrom, who has kind of written a lot about these topics in uh, is the so-called simulation hypothesis, which is that because com essentially it's very likely that we are ourselves in a simulation, uh, just because the number of simulations that could be run in the future, they'll be so easy to run with supercomputing power that uh, yeah, there would be so many simulated life forms and they will probably simulate all kinds of the past and just to kind of learn things from the past and that sort of thing that we could ourselves be simula uh, simulated and that's quite likely. So there are examples of like where artificial life looks very much like human life. You know, it could be a simulation, it could be uh, developments in technology that allow us to kind of closely replicate human brains, all that sort of thing, where the capabilities are essentially the same. It just is run in a slightly different way or created in a slightly different manner. And so... If you buy any of these arguments, and there are various other ways in which it looks less like humans, you know, it could be, I mentioned the idea of they're kind of being like sub processes of a computer right. that could have certain capacities and, you know, be uh, that we think warrant some kind of moral consideration. And just because the scale of the future is so large and the scale of these possibilities is so large, that there could be various kinds of artificial entities that seem at least plausibly to warrant more consideration, that this seems worth doing some preparatory work for essentially uh, and looking out for opportunities to think of ways that we can reduce the chances that if they do have interests and if they do warrant some kind of moral consideration that those interests are not ignored or those beings are not exploited essentially right so mm. yeah that's that's the kind of the scale argument and okay. yeah go on do you want to jump in with a question no 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 go ahead please Finish yeah your talk. yeah um again they neglected that argument that I mentioned before comes up even more strongly here, right? We've got a movement. It's a, a new and nascent movement in some ways, but a movement focusing on helping animals. Um, there is no such established kind of large number of people or who, who are focusing on this, on this problem. So it's a, it's quite a niche and a technical problem. And so I do not think that everybody listening to this should run out onto the streets and start demonstrating like this. That would probably be a bad idea because we don't understand the problem well enough. And there are, you, you're right to ask some of these kind of fundamental questions, like, is this kind of pain, is this kind of experience even possible? And so we don't know all the answers to that yet. So I think it's premature to run out and start openly, publicly advocating for moral consideration of artificial sentience. That said, I do think that like starting to, research into the topic more and potentially you know if there are people who are doing adjacent work like animal advocates for them to at least consider this as a possibility you know and this should in some ways affect 
the strategies that we take now, because we, like I was mentioning, the kind of knock on effects of the movement itself. Like we don't want to, it, it's not, the stakes are not just animals. The stakes are potentially these other beneficiaries in the longer term future. Right. So in terms of, yeah, that kind of neglectedness consideration uh, pushes in favor of this being a super important uh, area to work on. The tractability argument, <laughs> we're much less sure about that because it's so, uh, it's so distant and exactly what we should do is, is quite unclear. But yeah. there's a lot of uncertainty here and that suggests that at least some people should kind of work on, do some initial work on this topic and try and work out what seems promising, if anything, um, because, pretend, because how important it could be, you know, it doesn't take, it might not take that much effort for us to learn a lot about how prom just how promising and important this is for us to work on. Right. Okay. So Jamie, since we are at the end of the time, I wanted to just end with this question uh, in terms of your impact, uh, how do you sort of keep a track of what you're impacting? I know, I mean, I, I mean, I don't know whether these are metrics, but from a day-to-day, week-to-week, month-to-month perspective, what gives you the satisfaction that you're in the right direction or uh, whether you should sort of change tracks or do something else or, yeah, I mean, what's your sort of uh, metric or uh, feedback mechanism that you're on the right track? Yeah, it's very tough. It's very tough for all this kind of uh, sort of meta work that works with other advocates and other people in these movements. Um, I'll, I'll answer first with Animal Advocacy Careers, the nonprofit I co-founded, because that there are some kind of more concrete things that we could do to measure this. So one example um, of one of the things that we're doing, I haven't kind of talked about this so far, but one of the things that we're doing is working with nonprofits to help them find candidates for their high priority roles. You know, if they're struggling to find a particular uh, person to fill that role, then we can try to help them find the person who would fill that role and fit it well. That's actually quite a tight feedback loop. You know, we can yeah. we can get the feedback, oh, well, look, we found the person. Uh, and there's still uncertainties, like how much, what you know, all those replaceability type things. So there's things like that, but we can at least get some useful metrics or proxy metrics and we kind of plug them into some kind of model that estimates what kinds of impacts we're having, that sort of thing. Um, the I mentioned before our online course, we've actually just very recently been doing some evaluation of that based on survey data that we had from the first round of that. And that seems promising. Uh, people are reporting that they've changed their plans in various ways. They've changed kind of which jobs they're planning to apply for, or they've changed their long-term career plans. Uh, some tentative evidence as well that people have already gone into different roles despite it being okay. quite a short period of time. Uh, and so there are things that we can do, especially with these more kind of tangible things that you can uh, evaluate it and measure what sorts of impacts it seems to be having. It's not harder for the research because the research is often going to be, it's going to be kind of one consideration. Like even if you imagine, I've been talking about, I talked earlier about the case for uh, sort of institutional tactics versus individual tactics. Even if we suddenly saw that the movement was shifting from individual diet change focused tactics to corporate and political tactics, we couldn't necessarily claim that that's due to us because there are other people making Sim there are other people making similar arguments and doing research that kind of points in this direction as well. So it's clearly not, well, it wouldn't necessarily be solely due to us. Um, in the other direction, like you might not see a change overnight, but it might be planting the seed for some important movement wide changes. Uh, so it's very hard to measure. You can do things mm -hmm. like survey your stakeholders and we've done a little bit of that and we'll probably do some more of that in the future. You can do things like uh, if you're, if one of your key audiences is academics, you can do things like track academic citations and all those sorts of things. So there are things you can start to do, but yeah, that is, that is harder <laughs> than my work at Animal Advocacy Careers to measure what impacts that is having. Fantastic. Uh, thanks. Uh, thanks, Jamie, for coming uh, on this podcast and having a conversation with me. Uh, I really enjoyed it. And uh, uh, I will put all the links to different reports and articles you mentioned here in the notes. Uh, and hopefully you'll continue uh, doing uh, more impactful work uh, at both of the nonprofits that you work at. Great. Yeah. Thanks so much. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Just, so, I guess some last shout out. So just to kind of clarify what I think are some of the most useful things that people could, could go away and do if you are interested in spending your career in ways that help animals. And that's not necessarily working directly for nonprofits. It could be all sorts of things. It could be in policy. It could be in research, it could be donations. Please do have a look at our website and Labsy careers, sign up for our newsletter because hopefully we'll have the online course soon. Uh, some of the more, you know, the strategic stuff I was talking about Sentence Institute, Top recommendation would be that foundational question summaries page that we have on our website that kind of lists arguments for and against. Some of the stuff we talked about later towards about 
uh, artificial entities. We do have some work on, on our blog and forthcoming on our research page. So yeah, have a look at that if you're interested in that stuff as well. But yeah, thanks so much for having me. And I, I hope bye-bye. listeners have benefited as well. Thanks. Yeah, I'm sure they have. Uh, they'll benefit. Okay, bye-bye. Take care. Thanks.